Okay, so welcome to this next video on synaptic vesicle fusion. Uh, so, so far in the first video, what we've talked about is the fact that we need to dock synaptic vesicles at the presynaptic membrane so that uh, when we um, get an action potential coming down the axon and arriving at the axon terminal, we can release uh, the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft very quickly by releasing uh, these vesicles which are docked at the presynaptic membrane. And this store of vesicles which is docked at the presynaptic membrane, this is known as the readily releasable vesicle pool because they can be released so quickly. So the readily releasable vesicle pool. Okay, right. So, uh, we then started to look at the structures underlying this docking complex, uh, the snare complex, as it's called, uh, which are these snare proteins. So we've seen so far synaptobrevin 2 in orange here, snap 25 in uh, turquoise here, and syntaxin 1 in blue here. So now, what we want to look at is uh, the interactions that hold this core snare complex together. So, I told you in the previous video that there is a layer of this core snare complex uh, called the zero ionic layer, which is basically where uh, amino acids in all four of these alpha helices that are contributing to the core snare complex, uh, they interact uh, by electrostatic interactions. Right, so let's discuss this further. So, synaptobrevin 2 uh, is often known as an R snare, okay, and this R snare refers to the amino acid which it contributes to the zero ionic layer, okay, whereas uh, syntaxin 1 and SNAP25, as well as being called the T snares, they are also referred to as the Q snares, so another name for these two are the Q snares. And the reason for that is, again, it refers to the amino acids uh, which these uh, two alpha helices contribute to the zero ionic layer. So uh, R and Q are the single letter amino acid codes for the amino acids uh, which these alpha helices contribute to the zero ionic layer. So let's begin with synaptobrevin 2, the R snare. R is the single letter amino acid code for arginine. So let me show you the structure of arginine, and then I can explain what sort of a charge arginine is going to have. So let's have a bit of a reminder of the amino acid structure of arginine. So let's draw up the core amino acid structure first. So here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. And also off the alpha carbon, you have this carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, and then you have the R group, which is specific to uh, different amino acids. So the R group for arginine has three methylene groups, and because I'm lazy, there's a nice trick uh, for drawing this quicker. So you can put brackets around a single methylene group and then put repeat that three times. And then you have a nitrogen coming off here with a hydrogen, and then a carbon with an amino group up here, and then a cut, this carbon is also double bonded to a nitrogen with a single hydrogen coming off it like that. Okay, so this is the structure of the amino acid arginine. Okay, now this nitrogen that is double bonded to the carbon here, this nitrogen that I've now circled in blue, this has a special name. This is referred to as the guanidino nitrogen of the arginine amino acid, guanidino nitrogen. Okay? And uh, it basically has a lone pair of electrons on it. So we'll draw that here. So it has this lone pair of electrons, two electrons in a lone pair together. Now these are a center of negative charge, basically. So what can happen, and what often does happen, is that you get protons coming and associating with this lone pair of electrons on the guanidino nitrogen. Okay, now protons carry a positive charge, so when they come and sit next to the lone pair of electrons on the guanidino nitrogen, it gives the overall head of the arginine amino acid, this head here, of the R group of the arginine amino acid, it gives it a positive charge. So basically the terminal of uh, the arginine amino acid has a positive charge. Okay, now let's talk about Q snares. So these ones here, syntaxin 1 and SNAP25. Q is the single letter amino acid code for the amino acid glutamine. Okay, so let me show you now the structure of the amino acid glutamine. 
So again, we'll start with the generic amino acid structure, which is common to all the amino acids. Here's the alpha carbon, and here off the alpha carbon we have the carboxylic acid group. Okay, and now the R group, in the case of glutamine, is you have a free carbon structure like so. And then off here, this, you have off this carboxyl group, it's been turned in basically to a primary amide. So you have a primary amide group on the terminal here. Okay, and then these carbons just have hydrogens off. So it's a free carbon group with then a primary amide group right on the end here. So this is the structure of glutamine. Now, uh, if we look at these bonds here, this double bond and this single bond, uh, there are electrons in this bond, these bonds. So let's have a look at this bond between the carbon and the nitrogen here. So the carbon will contribute one electron and the nitrogen will contribute another electron, okay? Now, do, the question is, do these electrons sit equidistant, equidistance rather, from carbon and nitrogen? So do they sit right in the middle of the carbon and the nitrogen? Well, the answer is no. The carbon nucleus and the nitrogen nucleus both exert a pull on uh, the electrons because the carbon and nitrogen nuclei, they're full of protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge and neutrons are neutral. So the nucleus of uh, atoms is extremely positively charged. That positive charge is pulling on the negative charge of the electrons here. Okay, so the question is, which nucleus pulls harder? Because they don't pull the same amount. Instead, the nitrogen nucleus actually pulls on these electrons more. So the fancy name for how much the nucleus of an atom pulls on electrons is its electronegativity. So when we say that the nitrogen nucleus pulls on electrons more than the carbon nucleus, the fancy way of saying that is that nitrogen's electronegativity is greater than carbon's electronegativity. So nitrogen will pull these electrons closer to it than they are to carbon, okay? And that will mean that the nitrogen gets a partial negative charge, okay? Because these electrons are slightly closer to it, and the carbon gets a partial positive charge. Okay, so the same thing is true of this carbonyl group here, which is the name given to a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Basically, the oxygen has a far greater electronegativity than the carbon, so the electrons in both of these bonds that make up this double bond here are going to spend more time near the oxygen than they will near the carbon, so it's going to give the oxygen a slight negative charge. So these groups right at the head of the glutamine amino acid, they are basically going to have this partial negative charge, okay? Right, and you might ask, but here we have another nitrogen. This surely has a lone pair of electrons. Surely it can gain a proton just like the guanidino nitrogen in the arginine, to which I would reply no. Uh, Nitrogen atoms that are in amide bonds like this, in amide groups like this, uh, they very rarely get protonated, and they certainly don't get protonated at physiological uh, conditions. Um, you have to expose them to very strong acids, basically, to get uh, the, uh, i.e. very high concentrations of proton, to get uh, this nitrogen here in an amide group to become protonated. So. The nitrogen in amide groups just doesn't get protonated, certainly not in physiological conditions. So it's not protonated, basically. So the end of this glutamine amino acid has a slight negative charge. Now, if I show you how uh, this uh, coarse snare complex here is going to form, what you're going to have is something that looks like this. Let's say uh, these are the two alpha helices provided by the SNAP25 protein. Here's the alpha helix provided by the synaptobrevin um, protein, and here's the alpha helix provided by the syntaxin 1 alpha helix. So, all that, uh, syntaxin 1 protein rather. So, all I've done basically is um, cut through there, and, and we're looking at a cross section basically. What you have is you have this arginine amino acid coming off the um, alpha, alpha helix of synaptobrevin 2. And then off all the other Q snares, you then have this glutamine amino acid here. Okay, now the arginine has a positive charge at its tip, and these glutamines all have negative charges. So this is this electrostatic interaction between the four alpha helices 
that make up this coarse snare complex at the level of the zero ionic layer. Okay, right, so that's, that's the ionic interaction that holds these four uh, alpha helices of the uh, four, um, well, sorry, of the three snare proteins together. Okay, now what we want to look at is the other interaction that holds the core snare complex together. Well, basically, what's believed to happen is these alpha helices are going to wrap around one another. So it's going to be like a thread. If you imagine taking all four of them and then wrapping them, twisting them together, that's believed to be what happens. And it's believed that this wrapping of um, the alpha helices around one another begins at these three tips over here, basically, and then it sort of spreads downwards towards the end. So that um, mechanism of sort of intertwining is what's known as the zipper mechanism. And it's called a zipper mechanism because basically it's going to start at one end and then the uh, intertwining of these alpha helices up is going to spread downwards uh, closer and closer to the, uh, the um, portions of the proteins which are attached or anchored to the uh, phospholipid bilayers. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.